make or break. On this vote, the yeas are 51, the noes are 49, the motion is agreed to. Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, a lifelong Catholic, clears a crucial hurdle on Capitol Hill. We'll tell you what's next. Abuse crisis, a report from Rome on how the Synod of Bishops is addressing the clergy misconduct scandals. It's a bird, it's a plane. A well-known actor tells us about his role in an upcoming pro-life movie. And that'll wake you up. At the Synod on Youth, a coffee break includes a surprise visitor. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, October 5th, 2018. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the nomination of Brett M. Kavanaugh of Maryland to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court shall be brought to a close? The answer is yes. Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh survives a make or break procedural vote with 51 senators yes and 49 no. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Mark Irons, in for Lauren Ashburn. Today's action tees up a final confirmation vote tomorrow night and senators can still change their minds. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi reports. Months of waiting, months of lobbying, months of debate about the future of abortion. For the women across our state who have a constitutional right to make their own health care decision. I worried that Judge Kavanaugh would threaten hard-won progress. Two female Republican senators who support abortion finally revealed their votes on Brett Kavanaugh. Ms. Murkowski. Alaska's Lisa Murkowski votes no, but two other on-the-fence Republicans vote yes. Ms. Collins. Mr. Flake. And one Democrat also says yes to end debate. Mr. Manchin, aye. Kavanaugh supporters celebrate. With this 51 to 49 tally, Kavanaugh's nomination moves forward to the final confirmation vote, where senators can still change their minds. Protesters target senators outside their offices and down hallways. Today in the Wall Street Journal, Kavanaugh makes a closing argument, explaining in an op-ed, at times my testimony reflected my overwhelming frustration at being wrongly accused. He says if confirmed, he'll be hardworking, even keeled, open-minded, independent, and dedicated to the Constitution and the public good. What does Judge Kavanaugh mean for Concerned Women for America? Well, Judge Kavanaugh is the kind of judge that we've been asking for from the beginning. This is why 30 million women voted for Donald Trump. Brett Kavanaugh needs 51 votes to take his seat here on the U.S. Supreme Court. If there's a tie, Vice President Mike Pence will be called in to cast a decisive vote. And right now you can see behind me U.S. Capitol Police arresting protesters, making one last pitch to senators to vote no. Mark? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey, thank you. Maine Senator Susan Collins says she'll vote in favor of Judge Kavanaugh tomorrow. So that we have far fewer 5-4 decisions, and so that public confidence in our judiciary and our highest court is restored. Mr. President, I will vote to confirm Judge Kavanaugh. The On the Fence Republican made her announcement this afternoon on the Senate floor. Collins has never opposed a Supreme Court nominee, confirming the past five justices from Republican and Democratic presidents. The White House is speaking out about today's vote. President Trump says on Twitter, quote, very proud of the U.S. Senate for voting yes to advance the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Joining me now for more analysis is Lindsey France, business and politics editor for the Independent Voter Network, a news platform that provides unfiltered political news and policy analysis across the political spectrum. Lindsey, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Judge Kavanaugh's nomination clears another hurdle today. We have yes, uh, yeses from Senator Collins and Senator Manchin on his confirmation vote. Is it evident that he's going to be the next Supreme Court justice? I think absolutely. There may have been a little bit of grandstanding by Collins, but she really got her point across. These swing senators are very powerful. They want to be swung by being convinced. And I think that this really makes a case for their mentalities and the fact that she's right. We've got a deadlocked Supreme Court. Session has begun. We need to get down to business. He's a superb judge. And this has really become political. Retired Justice John Paul Stevens, I'm sure you've seen this, once a Kavanaugh supporter, said he no longer thinks Judge Kavanaugh is, is fit for the high court. And he was referring to Judge Kavanaugh's testimony last week on Capitol Hill. 
Now Judge Kavanaugh writes in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, he might have been too emotional at times. Um, does that admission help dispel concerns that he might have political bias or his judicial temperament is not fit? Look, we need to make, uh, we need to understand that this is a human man who feels his family and his integrity are being attacked. So I feel like there needs to be more understanding for that. You know, I read a LA Times op-ed today by the editorial board saying that that's not right in a judge, uh, that's not right to, to be acting out like that and not right for a judge to think that way. That's a serious problem in how we view a human man reacting to his family being attacked. So there's no concerns about any political bias. You said this is a, you know, Democrats mad about uh, President Trump's election. Well, he can have his, his, his personal opinions uh, when he's feeling that he's being attacked. He's not saying anything we don't know as American citizens, that there is this attack sort of going on, uh, a partisan attack, and ir irrespective of the sexual assault allegation. Uh, so I think that we need to be more understanding that this is massive political bias and it's, it's okay to have some righteous anger. I for, once, I, for one, was not phased. I understand how some people would. That does not mean I feel that he is inappropriate because his record stands alone, that he has always been pretty temperate. Now, his nomination has fueled passionate debate from not only lawmakers but Americans, many of them women who have confronted senators in person on Capitol Hill, I'm sure you've seen it, about this vote. This kind of political engagement is something we haven't seen a whole lot of before. Do you expect to see more of it as we go into the midterms? Absolutely. Uh, there is an attack on people who side with due process, people who want to defer to that. Her testimony was very believable. It, was, it seemed heartfelt. It was heartbreaking. Uh, his was very believable as well. And so I think that this engagement on a very sort of over-the-top level is only going to continue. But what we need to also watch is the fact that there is a, a burning at the stake in the court of public opinion for people who want to defer to due process. And that's not okay. That's causing massive division in and of itself. Lizzie France, business and politics editor for the Independent Voter Network. Thanks for being with me. Thank you. An archbishop in Australia says the church is determined to do better on dealing with clergy sex abuse. We are realistic about the ways we've failed young people. Uh, I mentioned the, the whole abuse crisis, but there are other places where our evangelization, our catechesis, our liturgy, one way or another have, have shut people out rather than attracting young people and persuading young people. Archbishop Anthony Fisher of Sydney stressed he sees great hope in this synod among young people. He spoke today at a press conference at the Holy See Press Office. J.D. Flynn is editor-in-chief of Catholic News Agency. He joins us now from Rome. J.D., how has the sexual abuse crisis in the church been addressed so far at this synod? Mark, we're, um, we're, we're not privileged, of course, to everything that's going on inside the Synod Hall, so we don't know what every bishop has said. Um, but we do know that some bishops have raised the sexual abuse crisis in the short speeches that they give during the Synod's proceedings. This morning, Archbishop Anthony Fisher um, began his speech with an apology for the ways in which the church has failed to handle the sexual abuse crisis. Archbishop Charles Shapio of Philadelphia raised that issue in his speech. And Bishop Frank Caggiano of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, raised that issue um, I I at the very first uh, thing he said in his speech, his intervention. He said that if the church wants to gain the trust of young people and regain the trust of young people who, who largely don't trust large institutions, then she has to address the sexual abuse crisis during the synod, and then she has to um, credibly just respond to, to the ways in which she'll resolve it. So we know that some bishops are raising the issue. Uh, many people I've spoken with have said that the question still remains whether the Vatican understands this to be uh, a problem of the urgency and, and, and gravity that we in America perceive it to be. Um, and, and so we're waiting to see how, um, how the, the factor of the Vatican bishops and bishops from around the world will, um, will factor into what the American bishops which are, are asking for, which seems to be that the, the Synod uh, clearly address the sexual abuse crisis. And so I guess the next question is, how do you think this issue will shape the Synod document that's going to come out of this? Yeah, that's, um, that's something we're still waiting to, to find out. But we do know that um, the Synod document is, um, uh, comes about through um, the speeches that the bishops give and through the language working groups that they'll enter into uh, probably next week. But uh, last night at an event, B Bishop uh, Robert Barron, Auxiliary Bishop of Los Angeles, um, I I indicated that, um, in his view at least, um, a, a lot of uh, the elements that we'll find in the Synod document have already been addressed in the Instrumentum Laboris, the working document of the Synod. Bishop Barron said that um, yeah, it's his expectation that that will at least be the, the, the framework for the Synod document that 
that we shouldn't expect a major surprise. So there are ways in which the sexual abuse crisis can be worked into that document, but I don't think that we should expect it to be the focus of whatever comes out of the Synod. And after the last Synod in 2015 on family, the media focused on divorced and remarried Catholics receiving communion. So again, what do you think the main takeaway will be uh, from the Synod? The, the real debate in this synod, as most people understand it, is going to be uh, a discussion about how the church describes Catholics who are experiencing same-sex attraction, um, whether the church um, uh, validates the language of LGBT Catholics or whether the church continues with the, the traditional language used in the Catechism of the Catholic Church and other documents. So a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the debate will not be about um, the pastoral um, respect and compassion and sensitivity due, um, due to persons with same-sex attraction, but, but about the language the church uses and how that reflects Christian anthropology. Uh, that, that'll be the controversial issue. That'll be what we'll look for in addition to questions about the sex abuse crisis and, um, and then just continued discussion about uh, pastoral programs. Pope Francis has said that he wants the Synod document to, uh, to offer concrete pastoral uh, programs and initiatives. Usually Synod documents don't do that. For the most part, they tend to be theoretical, but we'll, we'll see what happens with this one. Okay, J.D. Flynn, Editor-in-Chief of Catholic News Agency, thanks for speaking with us. Thanks a lot. A young American taking part in the Synod says the church needs to go out and engage young people, not leave them behind. We've heard um, a diversity of focus. I need to reprioritize the family, sort of in continuity with the Morris Atizia, the last sin on the family. We've heard of the need of, uh, and challenges of, of reaching young people uh, as migrants, um, joblessness, addictions. And so uh, certainly there's a strong sense of reaching people where they're at. Jonathan Lewis, the 32-year-old who works for the Archdiocese of Washington. Next week during the Synod, he'll be talking about the importance of mentorship for young adults. A Catholic aid group is helping the recovery efforts following last week's earthquake and tsunami in Indonesia. A Vatican News Agency says Caritas Indonesia is among the groups providing food, water and medicine to the survivors. The country's three dozen Catholic dioceses are donating supplies. More than 70,000 people have been displaced by the disasters. Pakistan orders Catholic relief services to close its doors in the country. CRS is one of 18 international aid groups being forced out. Government officials provided no explanation. The groups have 60 days to wrap up their work. Police in Scotland say flying the Vatican flag in a provocative manner could be a criminal offense. The country has experienced centuries of violence between Protestants and Catholics. A church official calls the police plan, quote, very concerning. India is buying $5 billion worth of air defense systems from Russia. Prime Minister Modi agrees to the deal with Russian President Vladimir Putin in New Delhi. India was undeterred by a threat of U.S. sanctions against countries that trade with Moscow's defense and intelligence sectors. Modi says his country gives topmost priority to its relations with Russia. There's a lot more on the newscast tonight. Coming up, the unemployment rate in America reaches a historic level. Plus, Alliance Defending Freedom examines an alleged assault and a school's transgender bathroom policy. unemployment rate last month fell to 3.7 percent. It's the lowest level since December 1969. Also, the jobless rate among Hispanic Americans matches its record low. Welcome back. I'm Mark Irons in for Lauren Ashburn. The U.S. Department of Education says it's investigating a complaint over an alleged assault of a five-year-old girl in an elementary school bathroom. The girl's mother says the school's transgender restroom policy led to the incident, which was committed by a boy in the girl's bathroom in Decatur, Georgia. Joining me now is Christiana Holcomb, legal counsel for the Alliance Defending Freedom. Christiana, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. You say the school uh, put this young girl in harm's way because of its policy. How do we know it's not just a case of assault regardless of the policy? Well, we can speculate all day, but what we do know is that in this particular case, a young boy was allowed into the girl's restroom pursuant to the school's transgender restroom policy, where he then sexually assaulted this little five-year-old girl. That's a tragic situation, and the school clearly violated its duty to protect all students. And do we know for a fact that the boy identifies as gender fluid? Is we do. Yes, yes. The little boy identifies as gender fluid, so he was properly there under the policy. But again, that clearly violates this young girl's right to be safe and to have her privacy protected at school. Now some parents in the Georgia School District say they weren't aware of this policy. It became public when it was posted by the superintendent on Facebook. He says protections for transgender students have been in place for at least 10 years. 
What responsibility do schools have to allow the parents to know what policies are put in place? Well, school, schools certainly have an obligation to inform parents, but I think the bigger problem here relates to the transgender restroom policy in and of itself. These policies clearly are not working. They put a little five-year-old girl in harm's way, which resulted most tragically in her own sexual assault. Now, the U.S. Department of Education, the Office for Civil Rights there, has launched an investigation into the school's response. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. and. Uh, what, what would you like to see happen going forward here? Sure, the OCR has opened an investigation and we are optimistic that as they proceed through uh, this process that ultimately the school will return to a policy that protects the privacy and safety of every student at Decatur Elementary. Uh, how optimistic are you? I think we're, we're quite optimistic. There's a significant amount of facts um, that support the little girl's alleged sexual assault and so we're optimistic that when carefully considered and looked into, that the school will ultimately do the right thing and return to a policy that protects every child. Is this about justice for the little girl or is it about overturning a controversial policy? First and foremost, it's about justice for the little girl. Her sexual assault was completely disregarded by her own school district, which has an obligation under federal law to investigate. We want to see justice done for her. Christiana Holcomb, legal counsel for the Alliance to Defending Freedom, thanks for being here with me. Thanks for having me. Plenty more to come on the show. Up next, we'll talk with one of the stars of an upcoming movie about the investigation into an abortion doctor. Plus, a coffee break you wouldn't want to miss. Melania Trump visits an orphanage in Kenya. She read children a book, then danced with them in a garden. The trip to Africa is her first initial extended trip as First Lady. Egypt is the next and final stop on her tour. Welcome back, I'm Mark Irons and for Lauren Ashburn. A movie opens next Friday based on the investigation and trial of an abortion doctor in Philadelphia. Gosnell, the trial of America's biggest ser serial killer is based on the true story of Kermit Gosnell. He was convicted in 2013 of killing three babies born alive at his abortion clinic. He is serving three life sentences in prison. Our own Wyatt Goolsby caught up with, uh, with one cast member you might recognize. Joining me now is one of the film stars, actor Dean Cain. You may remember him for his starring role as Superman in the 1990 series Lois and Clark. Dean, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Did you say 1990s? Oh my gosh. How that long was so ago, long right? ago. <laughs> Almost 20 years ago, I guess. I a little bit over 20 years ago mid now. Mid-2000s. Right. You play Philadelphia Police Detective James Woods in this new film who investigated abortion doctor Kermit Gosnell and helped put him behind bars. Tell us about your character and his tireless efforts to bring Gosnell to justice. Well, it's funny. Th th this didn't start off as an abortion clinic, you know, investigation or anything. It was a, it was a narcotics investigation. Uh, uh, Kermit Gosnell was selling narcotics on the street and the word got out and, and uh, Detective Woods went in and busted him, basically. And when they got inside and they raided the clinic, they found all of these horrors and all these awful things. And that led to the big giant investigation uncovering all of that. So it started as a narcotics investigation and he kept pushing and kept pushing because what he saw in there couldn't be right. And he was 100% correct, it wasn't right. Things that were going on in there were ghastly and terrible and, um, you know, there were, you know, uh, medical equipment wasn't sterilized. There were, you know, I, I don't want to get too specific to, to the gory details, but it was, uh, it was a house of horrors in a sense. And um, we, we cover that in the film. You don't see the most horrible things, but you understand what's there. Now, this particular movie, Gosnell, has been in the works since 2014. It's faced challenges in terms of funding and distribution. Why was it so, so important for you to take this role? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's an unbelievable story. And a lot of people want to step away from it, shy away from it, because the subject matter is, is, is difficult. It's difficult, and, and people feel very strongly about the subject matter. So a lot of people wanted to shy away from it, run away from it. I think it's a story that needed to be told. I thought that, that it was really well written. Andrew Clavin did a great job with it. I thought the characters all made a lot of sense. James, uh, Jim, you know, Jim Wood, what he did, he, you know, this is, a, this is a law enforcement officer who sees some wrongs and, and, and wants it out there and wants it to be made right, if you will. Uh, so for me, it was just a great story to tell. Uh, I, I knew it was going to be controversial. Uh, the controversy doesn't frighten me. Uh, and I don't want to take jobs just because you know, it's sort of the right thing to do politically or this or that. It, it was a great story and it's a really important story. So I had no fear taking the role and, and I'm honored to be a part of it. 
Okay. When it comes to acting in general, you've played Superman, but of course you've also acted in less mainstream roles like in the Christian drama God's Not Dead. How does your faith influence the different projects that you choose? Well, you know, it's interesting. When you see a lot of uh, actors, they'll, they're doing a cer cer uh, certain role, this, that, and then maybe they have kids. And suddenly they make a lot of kids' movies, and that's important for them. And, you know, you, you're doing things that impact your life sometimes at the times those things are impacting your lives. Um, you, a film like God's Not Dead, my son was going to a Christian high school. Um, we were talking a lot about, uh, about God and the Bible and things, and, and that film came along. Kevin Sorbo is a good buddy of mine, and he was producing it, and uh, I thought it was a great film to make him think and discuss faith. And so for me, that choice was specifically about my son and, and the fact that Kevin was a good friend of mine. And um, that, that was a surprise hit, that film. We didn't know it was going to do anywhere near as well as it did. We didn't know if it was going to be well received. Um, but I, I take, I'll, take, I'll take roles if I like a script or a character or a point of view, even if it doesn't mesh up with my own. I'll do that. And uh, I think it's important as an actor and as a storyteller to tell a lot of different kinds of stories. Well, it's so interesting to hear about your experience and, of course, to learn more about this movie. Dean Cain, one of the stars of the new movie, Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. It opens October 12th. Dean, thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. And our thanks to Wyatt Goolsby. The world-famous Mormon Tabernacle Choir has a new name. The gospel singing group will now be called the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. The name change is in line with the faith's new president who wants to end the nickname Mormon in place of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And finally tonight, this coffee break at the Synod on Young People at the Vatican provided quite a jolt. Yes, in the middle of it all is Pope Francis. He's among those enjoying a coffee break from the meeting of bishops. It's one of the lighter moments from the nearly month-long conference. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Mark Irons. We'll be back Monday with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.